Okay, hi everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, for our Pride blog feature, Natalie Meisner. Uh, Natalie Meisner is an award-winning multi-genre author. She's an English and writing professor as well as the director of change making at Mount Royal University. She's written poetry, a children's book, and plays with a focus, among other things, on family, motherhood, and the queer lived experience. Natalie has won numerous awards, including the Alberta Playwriting Award, the Canadian National Playwriting Award, and she served as Calgary's fifth Poet Laureate. Her most recent play, Legislating Love, the Everett Clippert story, has just won an Oscar. The Oscar Wilde Award for Best Script in the Dublin International Gay Theatre Festival. So congratulations, Natalie, and thank you so much for chatting with me. Thanks so much, Mark. And I have him right here. He's very happy. Oh, very nice. Best of all wilds to win. Like this fellow here, I went to go and see the, the Jade statue of Oscar Wilde that's out in by the Writers Museum there too. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's quite inspiring to think about what he as a queer writer and a queer person faced, um, you know, in that time period, above and beyond what we do face now. Thanks for, for having me on, Mark. Hi. Thank you so much. And on the topic of history, uh, the subject of your play, Everett Clippert, um, he's a pretty, uh, a pretty big figure in the local queer scene here in Calgary uh, and also in Canada. So I was wondering, like, if you could give a sort of summary of Everett Clippert, who he was, and also um, how he inspired your play. Sure. So Everett Clippert was one of the people one of the last persons in Canada to be jailed um, just for being homosexual. And uh, he was a beloved Calgary bus driver, apparently um, everybody's favorite uncle, warm, generous, kind. He grew up in Kindersley, Saskatchewan and then, and then moved to Calgary. But uh, one of the things that really attracted us, my, myself and the Calgary Gay History Project, uh, Third Street Theater and Sage Theater, all of the folks who've contributed to, to this project is that he somehow, despite spending 10 years of the prime of his life in jail, just basically for telling the truth, he admitted to being homosexual, whereas a lot of people were forced to stay in the closet at their job. He, when questioned, actually admitted to the fact that he, he's like, yes, I like other men. Um, and he tried to explain himself to the police rather than kind of going to the closet or hiding kindly, I might add. And for that, he spent 10 years of the prime of his life in jail. Um, and he, I guess the thing that really got us about him is that he wasn't trying to be a spokesperson. He wasn't trying to be an icon or a figure. He was just trying to live the best life that he could under those conditions. And he actually had the courage to kind of be proud before pride was, you know, kind of, this was like 1960 and then the 1950s, 60s. So before we had our Stonewall, before people could really come out and have pride parades in, in a lot of places, he was kind of gently trying to teach people that he didn't feel sick or wrong or bad. Um, and we were really lucky to have access to his papers. His family very kindly lent us his diaries that he wrote in jail, his letters that he wrote to everybody while he was in jail. One of the things that really warmed my heart about him is that he preserved his faith in humanity despite being treated really, really badly by his fellow humans. In jail, he would write limericks and uh, some of them kind of like, you know, fun and off color and scampy. And, uh, and in this way, I was like, wow, he would make a wonderful, wonderful subject because he's a queer elder. He's somebody very important to Calgary history. Um, he was somebody that was buried by history up until a very important news article and that's how we got interested in him. There was a, a Globe and Mail feature on Mr. Everett Clippert that kind of looked at the way that public sympathy kind of um, started to shift around then, just before decriminalization in 1969. Um, and it was his case was one of the very important ones. And that's what one of the things that prompted Trudeau Sr. to say the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation in 1969. So he became a figurehead, even though he didn't really want to become a figurehead. He was just this warm, lovable, gorgeous human being whose life was turned upside down. When we dug into the piece and found out that he was also a writer, like he was in jail reading Goethe and he was in jail writing limericks and writing all these literary 
kind of letters to people, well, that was a real gift. And it was at that point that the creative team attached to him and we realized, wow, we could tell a Calgary story that's also global. Um, we could tell a personal story that's also epic. And, uh, and he's just personally taught me so much about how to be a generous queer. Like as a young person, you see all the discrimination you have to face and it makes you very angry. It, it puts a chip on your shoulder and it gives you a lot of rage. And, I, and then kind of digging into his life, it's sort of, I sort of was inspired. I was like, wow, I guess I can keep giving to a culture that doesn't always appreciate me. He did it, so I can do it, you know? So he's, he's just been a touchstone and, uh, and a wonderful, you know, discovery for, I think, everybody that's come into contact with his story. There's been a documentary film. Uh, the Calgary Gay History Project has done all these beautiful features on him, too. He's been inspiring. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, that is, um, that is an absolutely inspiring story. And, um, and also, like, just thinking about um, how far we've come gay, you know, homosexuality wasn't decriminalized, you said, until 1969. And so that's not a long, you know, a long ways ago. Um, recent memory, I, I would say, for, for a lot of people. And um, gay marriage didn't come into legislation in Canada, I believe, until 2005 or 2006. Yes, yeah. That's living memory and, for me. I remember, like, hearing that on the radio. And up until that point, you never think it's possible. And now like, you know, yeah. I'm actually married. You have to kind of adjust. You're like, oh, that's something that I could have now. Um, interesting, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and it became legal in the US 10 years later in 2015. And that's when I, that was a significant moment for me, even though, you know, I'm Canadian up here. And now in, you know, in 2022 today, it appears that we, the LGBTQ plus community and being gay is almost entirely mainstream when you, especially, you know, in my case, when you look in at LinkedIn and see all the companies with their logos with the rainbow feature. Um, and so in your lifetime, Natalie, was there like a, did you ever notice like a, a, a real turning point in public sentiment? Was there ever an event? Was it, was it the legalization of gay marriage in 2005, 2006? Or was it some other event uh, that you would say significantly shifted public opinion? Or was it a more gradual change in, in, your, in your view? That, that, that's a super question. Um, because I think with legalization, um, at least in rural places, I come from a very small town, um, maybe in the gay village in a big city, these things are immediate, right? You get acceptance right away because there's rainbow flags and there's a rainbow crosswalk and, and nobody, you know, people expect that. But decriminalization did not reach anywhere near the worlds that I was living in. Uh, I wasn't yet born in 1969, but um, it takes culture some time to follow legislation. And likewise, I would say even after marriage became available, I also felt that what really made the difference were the cultural products that began to come in after, or the cultural, the works of art that came in after the legislation, not to say the legislation isn't important, but what I started to notice is that, wow, you can go in and, and look at a movie, you can see a movie and look, there's two dads there, and it doesn't have to be a problem. You know, it's not problem problematized, or there's a homosexual character who is not a serial killer. Wow, what a revelation. Um, and so those cultural products for me, maybe because I'm a creative and I'm a cultural worker, those are the things that really started to seem to make a big Im impact for me in my world. Because in rural spaces, people aren't always up on the legislation. They might not know, but they sure know if there's been a big budget movie that's showing positive, you know, showing, showing or not even just positive, but showing wholly human gay and uh, LGBTIQ plus people. Because I think up until very, very recently, they've either been stigmatized, problematized, simplified, demonized, or even sometimes more toxic, they have to be super happy. You know, if someone's tried to tell that Hallmark story about a queer too, that's also toxic because it's not a full human being. So I guess for me, what's really made the difference is when you can see fully human, fully embodied, characters 
on the screen, on the stage, in books, in novels that are um, fully realized. And that, and that, I don't know if I could pinpoint that, but I, I think that that has been kind of post-marriage in North America. I think that has been um, something that I can really see and it gives me so much hope when I talk to groups of young people as I get to in my job and I can see to them that being any kind of queer is just not a big deal to them anymore. It's just, if anything, it's kind of cool, <laughs> right? If anything, there's a slight uptick. It's like, oh, you're some kind, you know, you're, you're, you're in the, um, um, uh, somehow you are somehow outside the mainstream with your gender or your sexuality. Um, if anything, it's valued, which is a revelation. <laughs> in your experience, say in university, was this a topic that people discussed? Mm -hmm. um, I would say in my, like in my high school years, in the environment that I was in, it would have been physically dangerous to come out. And so I, I knew that I didn't. Um, there was a, a lot of hostility, like it would be, you would put yourself actually physically under threat. There was iterated, um, you know, latent violence, but also actual physical violence that took place. Um, the term spaggot dyke, you know, those were kind of put out there and, and there was scapegoating that was happening. So in that environment, um, I made the choice. I, I, I knew pretty much that I was lesbian and that I was attracted to women in high school. I kind of just went, I'm going to be out of here soon. I'm going to play a lot of sports and I'm going to get out of here. Um, so in the university setting, I would say it was still really stigmatized in certain corners. Um, so I played sports. I continued to play sports. Uh, when I played varsity basketball and soccer, there was open homophobia there. Um, I, I, I had uh, one time walked into a locker room, had one of the other women that was on the basketball team with me say, oh, you better put your clothes on because the coaches are coming in. Um, and I'm kind of like, what are you talking about? Like, we're always, you know, it's a locker room. Everybody changes. And she was trying to um, say that the coaches who were not out lesbian, but presented as probably lesbians might be looking at us. Um, I found this highly insulting. There's like no, you know, there was absolutely no reason. These are the most ethical women, the best coaches I've ever had. They were showing up for us every day. It was a foul thing for her to put forward. It also had the double impact on me that I was kind of navigating my coming out. So I was sort of like, oh, wow, um, I have to pass you the ball. I'm not going to want to, but now you've put that out there without me being fully out. So that was in my first year university. Um, sports, even though they could be a haven for differently gendered women, because you get to use your body and, you know, you get to use your body in ways that are outside of conventional femininity. I love that. But they were also a bastion of homophobia. So I kind of, I think for those reasons, maybe found theater instead. And there I found uh, my many gendered and my queer allied and my um, fabulous theater beasts, as I call them. There I found my, cho my chosen family because the first time I went to, to an audition, not being out, um, I auditioned for a role and the director said to me, incidentally, for this part, you would have to kiss a woman. Is that a problem? Uh, that wouldn't be a problem, would it? His assumption was like, you know, you could be gay, you could be straight, you could be anything in between. I'm telling you this role requires that. I hope you're cool enough not to find that a problem. And in my head, I was like, not only is that cool, that would be great. Um, so that, you know, I would say that university is a monolith. I've found in arts and cultural circles and thinking, you know, those kind of progressive uh, circles and especially in theater. I found a home for myself and maybe that's why um, theater and the arts and the literary world stole my heart. I could find uh, places for the selves that I wanted to be that weren't there still in mainstream culture at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a very similar experience in, in high school specifically. I'm not sure what it is with theater specifically that is just a a genuine safe space for for the uh, for queer kids but it you know it is and um and also not just queer kids but like straight allies too like all like everybody gay or straight you know whoever was in theater was like just a cool chill accepting person and that was um yeah that was a really that was a really nice change of pace i would say in in high school uh, and it attracted me and made me want to stay in the, you know, in the creative space. 
Um, and I'm very glad I, you know, I'm very glad that I did. Mm -hmm. You make a great um, so, point. Oh, I was just going to say yeah. for, for gay and gay, uh, the gay straight alliances within the theater community, also neurodiversity, um, also differently abled people, different bodies, like the value for different kinds of bodies um, that you see in theater culture and, and also different minds. And uh, it is just, I think, part of part of the thing that always keeps pulling me back to it.